Welcome to the lecture on eliciting conversation. From the previous lecture, we talked about greetings and opening conversation. Now we're going to talk about the middle life of a conversation. So after you get past the initial greeting with the hello, how you're doing, maybe perhaps when we get to the pursuit stage of the conversation, there's a lot that we can do to make sure that conversation stays alive and that we are able to maintain however long we want the conversation to go. Because maybe you're in one of those situations where you're good at saying hi to someone and maybe getting it started, but then the conversation falls flat right after that. So this is a whole lecture on that concept and those ideas, and hopefully this will help you make your conversations more deeper and more enjoyable. As a preview, there are three main ways that we can elicit conversation. We have topic elicitors, itemized news inquiries, and general news announcements. We're gonna talk about all three of these and we'll explain how exactly you can apply each of these three general categories of elicitors to your own conversation. We begin with topic elicitors. Topic elicitors basically ask a question about a person without suggesting a particular topic. So topic elicitors often are questions, and the key thing is they don't suggest a particular topic. So you're probably wondering, how do you ask a question without suggesting a particular topic? Well, a question like, how's it going, is a topic eliciting question. It doesn't really suggest any particular topic because what's it? I don't know, what is it? So it's just kind of this general sort of question where you're essentially asking your partner. So your partner is whoever the person that you're talking to is. We're gonna call them your partner, so your conversation partner. So it puts it on your partner to decide, and this is a, a key concept of topic elicitors and conversations in general, a mentionable, okay? So a mentionable is simply a topic that your partner finds worth mentioning in this particular conversational context. So here's the thing. When you ask someone, what'd you do, what'd you do last night? and they say nothing. I did nothing last night. Okay, they don't literally, they probably don't literally mean this. I sat with my legs crossed and I stared at a wall for five hours last night and literally did nothing. Like at the spiritual, like, you know, yogi type sense. No, 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 that's probably not what they mean by nothing, okay? Now, if you do have a friend that's like enlightened and stuff, that's cool, but that's probably not what most people are referring to. Most of the time when you ask someone, what did you do last night? When they say nothing, they did stuff, right? They probably like folded their clothes or they watched some Netflix show or they did, you know, maybe some cooking. I mean, there's probably a list of things that they did, but what they're saying is, I did nothing. What they mean is nothing mentionable, nothing worth mentioning in this particular conversational context, okay? So, a topic elicitor then, when you throw a topic eliciting question like, how's life, for example, you're putting it on your partner to decide what the mentionable is going to be. So your partner, if you guys are really close, for example, might start talking about th what they did with their niece or nephew last night, and then that you know the nephew and niece by name. And so niece and his nephews and what we did last night is the mentionable. But if it's somebody who's not close to you, they maybe they spent time with their niece and nephew, but that's not mentionable to you because you don't know them or they're not comfortable telling you these things. But in any case, a topic elicitor puts it on your partner, okay? So that's the key. You're putting it on your partner to decide what the mentionables are by asking them such a broad question, okay? So that's a topic elicitor. So questions like, how's life? How's it going? What you've been up to? Those kinds of things. Now, it can get gray areas because like, how was your weekend is also a topic elicitor. It still suggests, it sets a frame, like a, a time limit between Friday and Sunday, presumably. That's what we usually consider the weekend. So, but it's still pretty broad because it wasn't a specific thing. It was just, how was your weekend? Um, and so we'll talk about other types of questions too, because I'm sure there's a lot of other what if questions you might have. But the key thing is a topic elicitor is a question where you're having your partner create the mentionable and you're just putting it on them to say, 
you're, what you're basically saying, when you're saying, how's it going is you're saying, suggest a topic to me that we can start to topicalize. The next kind of elicitor is an itemized news inquiry. And an itemized news inquiry is oriented towards a particularly newsworthy item about the partner. So essentially, it's targeted towards an item, towards a specific item, towards a specific topic, if you will. Okay? Now, an itemized news inquiry could be things like, how did your test go? So you see over here, I'm asking about a specific thing that uh, I want you to talk about. Or it could be something like, are you still working at the newspaper? Or, you know, tell me about that article that you just wrote, whatever. So the itemized news inquiry is basically the opposite of a topic eliciting question where you're, instead of putting it on your partner to suggest what the topic's going to be, you're going to suggest a topic and you're going to have your partner topicalize it by giving you some information. So how is your, how did your test go? Then your partner has the option of talking about it went well or going into detail about the questions or anything like that. But your partner could also, you know, take it a different direction. Oh, it went okay. But uh, after class, blah, 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 blah. Okay. And so the test was, you answered the question, but then they introduced something else. So itemized news inquiries are generally questions as well. And they can generate topics because they already suggest something to your partner. Now, while we're on the topic of questions, there are three general formats of questions, and these apply to specifically itemized news inquiries. So first, you have close-ended questions. Close-ended questions generally have an A or B or C type format to it. So a closed-ended question would be something like, do you have dogs or cats? That's a closed-ended question because in the question, I suggest the possible answers. So do you, have, do you like dogs or do you like cats? Now, you have the option of saying neither. I actually like birds and horses. Okay, cool. But that's what it makes a closed-ended question a closed-ended question. I suggest the answers, the possible answers in the question, and then you can just select the possible answer, so A, B, or C, so forth. Then you have leading questions. Now, these it's easy to get mixed up between closed-ended and leading questions. So what makes a leading question a leading question is it can only be answered with yes or no. And the way it's phrased is it's phrased in a way where you're just confirming or denying. So a leading question would be something like, you went to the store yesterday, right? Okay, and you said right. And when you were there, did you not see the sign that said blah, blah, blah? Oh, I saw it. Okay, blah, 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 blah. So a leading question is a question where you simply confirm or deny the, the answer, okay? So the leading question is loaded with information and you're just answering yes or no, right, correct, or you know, affirm, deny, essentially. That's what makes a question leading. It's leading you towards a conclusion and then you're just affirming the premises as you reach that conclusion. So I could say something like, you're an athlete, right? So that's a leading question. So it's implied that when I say you're an athlete, right, that you're supposed to affirm that, you're supposed to say yes, because I wouldn't ever phrase it in a way where I would want to be rejected, right? So I wouldn't say you're an athlete, right, if I actually thought you were a non-athlete. I would then just say you're not athletic, correct? Because I, nobody likes, nobody wants to ask a question like, you're an athlete, right? No, okay, good, that's what I thought, you know? Uh, that, it's like weird, okay? So that's leading questions. Now, there's interesting ways where leading questions can become problematic. Suppose that you have a friend who plays tennis and you don't think they're very good and they had a match yesterday. So imagine phrasing the question, so did you lose yesterday? Versus, oh, did you win yesterday? So phrasing it as, so did you lose, kind of implies that you were expecting them to lose and it's just kind of like, eh, you know? But if you win, you know, you're, you at least high, had high expectations of them and then, you know, maybe they let you down, but you know, hey, at least you had that presumption that maybe they won, okay? So the third would be open-ended questions. And these are your typical questions where 
they're open-ended. There is no implied answer. There, it's not answered with yes or no or a limited uh, answer set. Tell me about where you're from. So where are you from? There's, you can answer that however you want. Or how do you feel about Stranger Things, the show? So there's no, you can't answer that with yes. Yes, that's how I feel. Like, no, I mean, you have to like go into detail. Oh, well, I really like the show. You know, I think Eleven's cool, blah, 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 whatever. And there isn't an implied answer like about it either. So how do you feel about the Stranger Things? Maybe it's positive, maybe it's negative. What did you think of the late, the, the newest Disney movie, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so it can go either direction. So that's what makes it open-ended. There's no answer set implied. Now, we're gonna talk about this idea called topic curtailing later. And we'll talk about how topic curtailing, so I'll just write it down for now, but we're gonna have a whole slide on this. We're gonna talk about how this comes into play. And topic curtailing is how you limit the expansion of topics. The third type of topic listener uh, is general news announcements. And these are more or less, I mean, there's different terms in conversation analysis, this is what they call it, but essentially you can think of general news announcements as more or less personal disclosures. And remember, disclosure is just simply when you volunteer information about yourself. So in a general news announcement, you wouldn't be asking a question, you would be making the offer first of a topic. So you would be making some kind of disclosure or statement to get the conversation rolling. So an example would be, I went to the doctor today. That would be a general news announcement. So instead of saying, so what did you do today? The way you might start the conversation is, you know, I just went to the doctor yesterday. And then you'll let your partner then ask a question or topicalize it however they want. So maybe your partner will say, oh, what happened? You know, are you okay? And then you can have that kind of conversation. Or I went to the doctor yesterday and your partner maybe like to compare experiences. So, oh yeah, I went to the doctor too. This is what happened, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so what makes a general news announcement a general news announcement is just the idea that you're offering the topic. So on, it's on you to suggest the topic because now you're making the offer of whatever you disclose that that's what's gonna be the topic of the conversation for that particular moment, okay? Now, one of the ideas of conversation in general is when you run out of topics, you run out of conversation. We kind of all know this where maybe, you know, um, you were talking to someone and it was okay for like the first few minutes and then you just kind of hit that lull where there's like, it's just awkward silence because you don't know what to talk about next. So conversation runs on the idea of topicalization. So this is where, once again, you've heard me say this and I don't know if I've written it enough or not, but I really want you to remember this term, topicalization, where we topicalize ideas. And what it means to topicalize is to ask questions, make disclosures, and to basically explore the topic um, linguistically. Now, but don't think of topics, though, as a list in your head, okay? So we tend to think of topics as sort of like, you know, gas. So if like this is our gas tank, and we're like, oh no, I'm running low on topics. It's getting lower and lower. You know, and then like soon you only have a little bit left and like, no, I'm out of topics. Now it's awkward, you know, that kind of thing. I wouldn't really think of it that way. Topics are all around you. They're constantly being generated. I mean, even when you're sitting in a room at a coffee shop, like, you know, there's things going on. There's people sitting next to you. There's noises, you know, there's smells. There's all kinds of things that can elicit topics. There, there are infinitely many topics that you can always explore. Don't always be focused on just the person's like personal history and characteristics. Think bigger. Think about the world that you live in, the, the context that you're currently sitting in, you know, what your future is, what your past is, what your present is, and you'll always have topics to bring up. And the better you get at conversation, the better you get at topicalizing pretty much anything. And in fact, my sister-in-law is a really great conversationalist. Like she's worked in retail and all these jobs that are very people focused. And I've noticed why she's such a good conversationalist. She's actually really good she doesn't ask a lot of questions, but she just picks the right like personal disclosures where when she says something, you can clearly relate to it and then you want to disclose and she never asked you to, but she just, you know, says like this really cool thing that she did yesterday and um and she'll even pick really mundane things like, "Oh, I was just washing my 
I was washing my hair today and I found, you know, like a gray hair, blah, 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 or something. Just something so mundane you wouldn't think much about. But she tells it in such an interesting way. Then you want to share your story or like relate to it somehow. And the next thing you know, you're talking for an hour and you feel really comfortable about it. So that's the power of journal news announcements, I think, is being able to make the right offers to where the person that you're talking to opens up. Now we're on the subject of topic curtailing. So topic curtailing is essentially the, um, and I, there's a lot of ways you can word this, but basically topic curtailing is um, prohibiting, we'll just call it that, prohibiting topicalization, okay? So think of topic curtailing as the opposite of topicalization, where topicalization is exploring, curtailing is keeping short. Now, we have terms for this in our colloquial, like everyday life. Probably the best is, John was really short with me yesterday. What we mean is, when I was trying to talk to John, like, hey, John, how's your day going? He was just like, good. Okay, is there any, you know, life's good? Yeah. Okay, um, how are your kids doing? Good. You know, and like, they just, they don't let anything expand, essentially. They give very minimal answers, if any answer at all. So, Here's the thing, any of the three types of elicitors can be curtailed. Of course, if we do like a confirmation, like a close, a leading question, you know, did you do this right? Yeah. Uh, you know, and then if you try to do like a general uh, itemized news inquiry, so how was your day? Good. Do an open-ended question. So what do you think of Stranger Things? Oh, that's all right. So you see how we can easily just not topic or tail and not create any offers? And even if I do something like a general news announcement where I'm going to disclose something, I went to the store. I went to the hospital yesterday and it was in the emergency room. Oh, okay. Like they didn't ask or anything. Like they didn't topicalize that, even though that's probably a big deal. And you should ask, oh, why were you in the emergency room? So you can still see that with all three topic listeners, if somebody doesn't want to talk, they can find ways to curtail the talking. So a lot of people ask like, so how do I make this and this person converse with me? Well, they have to want to converse in the first place, right? You can't make somebody who doesn't want to dance dance. I think of, I like to compare conversation to, to salsa dancing or swing dancing. It's like you can't make the unwilling dance, okay? So if the person doesn't want to dance, they're not going to talk. They're just going to curtail everything. Um, with shy people, what you can try to do is with shy people, disclose first and then ask and then ask. But, you know, a lot of times what happens is what we want to do is ask, then disclose. So we ask them how their day is going, and then we disclose how ours is going. But sometimes we need to do the opposite. Sometimes we should disclose first and then ask versus ask and then disclose. You know, have you ever been in a situation where you felt like your conversation was like an interrogation because you kept asking questions and you kept getting short answers and you had to keep asking questions to get the person talking? We try to avoid that, okay? We try to avoid interrogations. So if you're in that situation, try disclosing first and then asking and see if maybe that will get people to not topic or tail or begin to offer topics that are interesting to them. Now, another aspect of conversation is the layers of intimacy that which conversation can reach. So we call them the four layers of talk. Now, I have these written out ahead of time just so you can easily see the quotes. So first, you have cliches, and what makes cliches cliches is just that they're your typical scripted conversation that you have with pretty much anyone. How are you? How's your day? How's the weather? You know, those kinds of things. Like very cliche, just everyone hears them. They don't really go anywhere. So just even how are you is an example. So after you hit cliches, you might get into facts, okay? So facts might be something like, let's say it's before class or something, and you say, did you do last night's readings? Okay, so that's a fact question because it's, it's something that's either true or it's false. So it could be, you know, did you do the readings last night? What, the weather's hot today. Or, you know, um, I went to the store yesterday. I went to HEB yesterday. Those are all facts. Or did you go to HEB yesterday would be a fact question. Now, a lot of people live here, okay? So this is the extent of their conversations go to cliches and facts. Often business conversations, task-oriented, like to live in the cliches and facts. You have a little bit of small talk and then you talk business. And that's it. And that's the fullest, then the furthest that your conversations go. You would probably not call these people your best friends. 
You would probably call these people like associates or, or uh, partners, you know, those kinds of things. And then people who you just exchange cliches with, if we were just to delete some of this here, those are probably just acquaintances. If you just have the, hey, what's up? You know, that's it kind of thing. Now, if we expand out of here again, we go to feelings and opinions. So now you're asking about how the person feels about a particular topic and what their personal opinion is. So did you agree with the argument? Did you enjoy the readings? Are both questions about feelings and opinions. So I can start with, you know, hey, how's it going? And then did you do last night's readings? And then as a deeper level, did you agree with the readings or do you like reading? You know, do you enjoy doing the readings? These are questions about how you feel and how someone views the world. So these are a little bit more personal because a lot of times people withhold opinions about things because maybe their opinion makes them seem a certain way or they don't want to share their personal thoughts on something because they don't know how people would react. They might feel like they get rejected. So when you feel really comfortable with someone, you tend to share more of your feelings and opinions about issues and you know how you, what you think about this and this topic and how you feel about that and that topic. But then there is a fourth layer, and this is the deepest layer, and that is the personal layer. So the personal layer is where you talk about the person's being as a whole. So you're kind of going meta on the person in a way where you're talking about their holistic being. So would you consider yourself an avid reader? Are you the adventurous type? Are you, um, are you more of a city person or like a farm person? Okay. So what makes it personal is that it's very much holistically who they are as a whole. And it's going to be things that are very central to their identity and who, what makes them a person talking about their religious viewpoints, you know, so, you know, it might be something that's more personal. Okay. Now these are the four layers of talk, but there's always some gray areas and there, there can be ways where, you know, there are certain fact questions that are like facts, but are still very personal facts. Like how much money do you make? It's a fact question but it's still also a very personal fact that people still may not share. So it's not the case that just because you talk about facts that you're not becoming more intimate or you're not like, you know, feeling like you're not, you know, that your conversations are shallow. Therefore, it's just that the deeper that you go, the more feelings and opinions, the more holistically you share your worldviews and who you are, the, the deeper that your talk is going to be, the more intimate that you're going to feel. But there's definitely places where, even a fact, sharing a certain fact can still be personal and intimate, okay? But it's a good little rough guideline of just where people go. So the idea is this. If you're trying to, you know, a lot of people say, so if I go on a date, what should I do? So you don't want to live in cliches, obviously, if you're on a date, because that's really boring. You want to do talk about facts because you want to get to know the person. But what you really want to do is try to get to the, the deeper layers, the, the feelings and opinions and the personal stuff. So if you're kind of like getting a lot of first dates or you're like feeling like you're in the friend zone all the time and all that, it might be because you're living here and you need to start thinking, how do I get down here more? How can we talk about topics that kind of allow us to share this? But then also remember, you have to be compatible in the sense that like you should agree on these things and so forth. But that's a whole other lecture and topic. But yeah, I would start by analyzing your conversations. What kind of topics are you bringing up and what exactly are you mentioning and not mentioning in your conversations? And this is also true if you're trying to make best friends, you know, you're trying to make new friends in an area. You probably don't want to live here either. When you're trying to become friends with someone, you're, you want to still live here too. So yeah, there's a lot of factors that go into it, but always think about your conversations and your topics. The next concept I want to introduce you to are topical pivots. And the basic idea behind topical pivots is just that a topical pivot is a topic that can transition from another topic without justification. So a topic that can transition from another topic, okay, without justification. So here's what we mean. You bring up the topic of, so yesterday I went to my brother's baseball game, okay? Now, maybe I don't play baseball, maybe I know nothing about baseball. So, but maybe I'll use the baseball game, so we'll say baseball game, 
okay? I'll use baseball game as a way to bring up uh, playing soccer yesterday, okay? So baseball game allows me to, ta to pivot to, um, oh, that's cool you went to your brother's baseball game. I actually played soccer yesterday. So we were both outside, that's cool, okay? And so the reason they relate is they're both outdoorsy activities, you see? So I pivoted off baseball game to playing soccer yesterday. But perhaps a more clear example, if that was like a little too weird for people, you know, um, here, let me erase this real fast. So if you, if you wanna think of this more simply, I usually do this with my face-to-face -face classes. I just usually, I don't know why I didn't do a slide on this, but okay. So you would have something like this. You can say, um, I went to HEB yesterday. Okay, so we'll just pick a sentence like this. Actually, I should probably keep this on the line so I don't get in the way here. Okay, so I went to HEB yesterday. Okay? So, there's all kinds of topical pivots that are in this sentence. So, if I was just given this one sentence, there's all kinds of conversation that you can make just off this sentence alone. So, we could ask, you know, first we can just say, uh, went. First, you can topicalize I, like, who are you? You know, that kind of stuff if you wanted. Um, but let's just say you already know who I is. So went, like how did you go? Or how was traffic? Like what time did you go? Would be a question, right? Oh, what time did you go? Because maybe like, oh, because if it was at the 11 o'clock, you know, rush hour, blah, 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 okay? Um, H-E-B, there's all kinds of topicalization there, right? Like, because you could talk about what did you get? Which H-E-B? Uh, have you tried Sprouts, you know, or something? There's all kinds of topics that you can say there. And then yesterday, you know, so like, when did you go uh, yesterday? Um, did you do anything after? Okay. And that's just off what was directly stated. And then we can ask, you know, if we were just to take the whole concept as a whole, we could say, you know, um, oh, you know, uh, do you like grocery shopping? So... There's all kinds of ways we can topicalize. Like, there's all little pivots here. So every little topic here is a way to pivot, okay? Every little word can pivot to something else, you see? So in, in one book that I read back, when, back in the day, they called them conversational cherries, where you pick the cherries. So H-E-B is a cherry. So we can draw a little red here. H-E-B is a cherry. Yesterday is a cherry. This is a cherry. You just pick the little cherries, okay? But the more proper term is topical pivots. Now, I want to talk about some specific elicitation techniques. So I've given you all these little questions that you can ask and topical pivots and all that stuff. But then there's also just little techniques that you can use to also elicit conversation without having to add anything, okay? So these are techniques that are used for listening. And for those of you in the online interpersonal class and the face-to-face -face, technically, but you're gonna, part of your assignment's gonna be using these techniques in your coffee conversations, okay? So I'm going to give you six techniques to try out in your coffee conversations or just in your real life in general, because these are usable. So the first technique, and this goes with this one, is the summarize technique. And basically, let's say my, the initial statement was, I've really gotten into kayaking lately since I moved here. Okay, so maybe it's like an Austin thing and you're at Town Lake. You got to call it Town Lake. You can't call it Colorado River because people get mad. Uh, and you can't call it Lady, Lady Bird Lake unless you're new to Austin. Okay, so there you go. Call it Town Lake. All right, so... Um, so you summarize it like, so you've become a surfer since becoming, actually, that should be kayaker. That's a weird question. We'll put kayaker there. Okay, so summarizing. Uh, so you've become a kayaker since kayaking here, okay? So, you know, you're basically summarizing. Actually, see, this was, I messed up this slide. Whoa, okay, got to do grammar check. <laughs> that was like, sounded so weird. Okay, so you've become a kayaker since moving here. Yeah, that's really what that should have said. Okay, so summarizing. So let's say person A says, I've gotten really into kayaking since moving here. Summarizing would just simply be repeating what they said just in your own words. So you just summarize the statement. Another way you could rephrase it is you've gotten into kayaking. So this is called parroting. Now here's the deal. Parroting is where you take one phrase, gotten into kayaking, and you just repeat it in your response. So here, your partner says, I've really gotten into kayaking. Oh, you've gotten into kayaking. So 
summarizing, you're taking what they say and you're putting it in your own words. Parroting, you're literally repeating a phrase that they said. So if your partner said, I went to a meeting yesterday, meeting yesterday, okay, that's a parrot, okay? And then the idea is that when you parrot it, your partner's supposed to expound on that topic. Meeting yesterday, oh yeah, you know, the meeting about blah, 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 oh, okay, you know, that and so, and so forth. Now, you also have the option to elicit, just ask more questions. So that's where you topicalize. So where do you like to go kayaking? I've gotten really into kayaking lately since I've moved here. Whoa, where do you like to go kayaking? Okay, pretty, pretty straightforward there. You can also disclose. So uh, I've really gotten into kayaking since I moved here. Oh, I've just started kayaking too. So here you disclose at Town Lake. Now, another option is a continuer. And I use this myself a lot. I've really gotten into kayaking lately since I moved here. Uh-huh. And see, when I just say uh-huh, what I'm basically saying is, okay, I'm passing on my turn. Like I heard you, but I'm not going to add anything because I want you to keep going. Because see, once I say, uh-huh, then I've really gotten kayaking since I moved here. Uh-huh. They're going to add something to the, to the statement now. Now they're going to say, and it was really fun. Or, and I almost got bit by a shark. I mean, there aren't sharks in Town Lake, but you know, just, it would be funny though. If there, you know, if that was, you know, no, it wouldn't be funny, but you know what I mean? Okay. So, um, I, so that's the idea of continuers is continuers are, you kind of forfeit your turn and then you just allow the person to expound more on what they say. And then we have this other one. And a lot of people think this one's interesting. It's called the stare nod. Now, obviously you can only do this in face-to-face -face conversations. You really can't, I mean, you could sort of do it on the phone, but it's really difficult to pull off the stare nod. So the stare nod is basically you just stare and you nod. So I've really gotten into kayaking since I've moved here. Okay, so I'm staring and nodding my head at the imaginary person, okay? Now, the stare nod works because it's kind of like an uh-huh, but you're not saying uh-huh, you're just nodding your head, okay? And you're kind of like nodding it slowly and looking at them. Now, here's the thing. When I first shared this technique with my Arkansas kids, when I taught at Arkansas State, one of my students came back like three weeks later and he was just married. They marry really young there, like at 21, 22, and he was like, I used to stare nod on my wife all the time and it really works, you know? So, uh, you know, so I had a, some positive results there. So yeah, the stare nod is definitely something that you can use. So four, like three of these, actually four, like four out of the six, six of these, or, uh, excuse me, five out of six of these don't involve you volunteering any information. It's just using whatever they have and just getting them to expand more. The only one where you give more information is the disclosure. But that, you don't have to use that if you don't want to. So there's a lot of ways to elicit conversation. And you don't even have to be the most interesting person with like these crazy epic stories. You can just get people to talk more about themselves and they'll feel more comfortable. Now there's this concept in improv theater called making offers. And the idea is this. When improv actors start a scene where they have no idea what the script is, somebody will start by making a statement about the situation that they're in. And that's the offer. So let's say you have two improv actors and, and they're told you need to act in a scene where you're two police officers who just had lunch and you're having to catch a criminal. And so the first actor will say, oh man, we got to find this criminal. It looks like they're running rest right now. Okay, so that's an offer. And then the partner actor is then supposed to take that offer and build on it. Oh man, quick, get, put on your boots so we can get running, you know, something like that. Okay, so they build on each other's offers. So an offer is simply a statement or action to build conversation. And that's essentially another way to think about disclosures. So did you watch the game last night? Um, might be a question. The way you can turn that into an offer is, my friends and I went to the game last night, the student section was wild, okay? So you don't always have to put things in questions to build conversation. You can put them in interesting statements. Where are you from? Well, I just moved, instead of that, you could say, I just moved here from Arkansas. I'm really like the scenery out here. And then that's an offer. And then your partner can reply, you know? And then I have two brothers and a sister and you can make an offer instead and say, check out my family photo from our most recent vacation. Here are my brothers, here are my brothers and sister, okay? And there, that's an offer to allow somebody to respond and you know, provide their own family photo or to say where they are from or to talk about their experience with the game last night. Now, the reason offers work 
and the reason disclosures work in general. So this is why I encourage you to self-disclose to help make conversation. One is because it assumes rapport. So a lot of people ask, how do you build rapport? Well, you don't, you just assume it. So when you can, rapport is just the ability to openly communicate with a specific person. The key to doing well is just to assume it. People don't wanna be sold to, okay? They just want good products and service. In this case, people don't need to be sold to to have a conversation, just give them good conversation. Assume that you're on a level where you can have that good conversation. Now, there's such thing as over-assuming where you don't wanna start disclosing really personal things, but it's okay to assume rapport and to disclose. Don't feel like that you have to ask a certain number of questions first. But secondly, reciprocity. We have this norm in human interactions called the norm of reciprocity, where if I do something for you, you should do something for me, generally of equivalent value. So this idea of like, we're not supposed to be freeloaders, the idea that if I do something nice for you, you should do something nice for me. In conversation, if I disclose something really personal and you know interesting, you should disclose something personal and interesting. So making offers works for these two reasons. Now I want you to go ahead and read this first page of text and see how you can, how topicalization applies here and see if just like for yourself, just to quiz yourself, where do you see different topicalizers? So go ahead and pause the video and read this. Okay. So did you see the topicalization here? So first you have your greeting, how's your day going? So that's uh, a top, a topic eliciting question. It's going okay yourself. Oh, it's going. How did your softball game go last night? So that's an itemized news inquiry. Well, we won. The team was ahead. So they're giving a disclosure here. Well, that's awesome. So congratulations, adjacency pair. Okay, thank you. So you say thanks to congratulations, another adjacency pair. I watched the Olympic trials last night. So this is, I'm sorry, I wrote this a long time ago. And uh, Gabby Douglas has won the form. So this is a personal disclosure because you see there's a little here. Is there, there, it's not based on any... Whoa, what the heck just happened? Okay. It's not based on any question here. Stop doing that. Okay, so there we go. Uh, sorry, my hand hits the one of the buttons. Okay, so anyway, so you make this disclosure here. I watched the Olympic trials last night, okay? Now here's a second stretch of text. Go ahead and read this and quiz yourself. So go ahead and pause the video. See if you see what I see. I know that sounds like a tongue twister. So you see here that Mark responds by, I haven't watched any Olympics trials so far. I'm not as big in gymnastics. So you have a little personal disclosure there too. So feelings and opinions here. So if we talked about the layers of talk, we could, we could go back and analyze this from the layers of talk as well. Um, so you're not big into gymnastics, so you can kind of see a, a personal, you know, kind of like a personal questionnaire. No, I'm more into the team sports like basketball and soccer. So it's just all about what we want to analyze here. And then Abby uses a continuer here. So this is an uh-huh continuer, but I still cheer for America regardless. Hey, you like to watch America's teams work together and take on the rest of the world. Okay. So that's a summary summarizing. Yeah, that's right. And then another question. So this is how conversation works. This is how we topicalize. We, we get each other to speak on something specific. And that's how that's conversation in action. In conclusion, conversation is played by implicit rules. Even though we may not directly state the rules a lot of times in conversations, we all play by them. How well we play by the rules to support our partners makes us better conversationalists. So you know, better conversationalists based on how well we play the, how well we play the game, essentially the game of conversation, the rules, if you will. And topical expansion and curtailing is the lifeblood of relationship development. So remember, we go back to how well we converse causes us to draw inferences about the state of our relationship. Well, if you want to be very, very specific about how that happens, it comes down to topical expansion and curtailing. What topics do I have access to? if we're in a close relationships versus topics that I don't have access to if we're not in a close relationship. Or if we're in a close relationship and we decide we're not gonna talk about X, Y, and Z anymore because it causes us to be mad, you can understand now how curtailing certain topics and keeping some topics off limits can cause problems down the road. So really, communication is the lifeblood of relationships and if you wanna be very specific, topical expansion and curtailing. What we give people access to and what we don't give people access to ritualistically, is the, the forefront of, relation, of relating. See you next time.